I think I first became familiar with your work through the four hour work week, which was a really cool book. The idea was outsourcing things that were repetitive in your life that you didn't need to do yourself uh, and get some passive income. The book that really hit it for me was Four Hour Body. Um, I turned 50, I got this book, I followed your, your slow carb diet, lost probably 30 pounds of fat, gained 10 pounds of muscle, and I'm like, this guy's onto something. I mean, from four hour work week, four hour body, four hour chef, you have this kind of insatiable curiosity. And like um, our previous guest, our mutual friend Kevin Kelly, he's got this kind of insatiable curiosity about not only learning, but how to optimize learning and then apply it. So why don't you talk about kind of your, what are some general principles about learning? So, because you, you attack new things, tango, chess, new languages. What are the general principles that you apply to all of these things that you, that you decide you want to find out about? Uh, well, the, the very first is recognizing, I think, that for anything, if you want to take the path less traveled and, and shortcut from point A to point B, you have to ask different questions, and sometimes very uh, ridiculous questions. So, for instance, this entire event is a fantastic opportunity, I'm going to do this for the next few hours, to walk from innovator to innovator asking them questions like, you know, what is something you believe that other people think is crazy? Uh, who is really good at this, whatever that might be, you know, designing kayaks or, or building robots, who shouldn't be, who doesn't have the training, who maybe has some type of handicap, right? Like the Paralympics are a great way to study how to become better at different events, even if you're not uh, disabled in any way, like swimming, right? How do you swim without legs if, if, if one of your complaints, one of your reasons for putting it off is becoming exhausted through kicking, which was the case for me. I didn't learn to swim until I was 31 which is really embarrassing considering I grew up on Long Island, you know, rat tail and everything. <laughs> so th the first is asking questions. And the framework that I use for learning, whether it's tango, like you said, or natural languages, I concluded I was bad at languages in high school uh, f and, and felt that way for a very long time. It was totally unfounded, is, uh, is DISS. So D-S-S-S, -S -S, uh, and the, the I is silent, I guess. So you have deconstruction which is taking, you know, learn Spanish and breaking it down into smaller component pieces and also doing the interviewing and things like that. Uh, there's selection, and so, which is doing an 80-20 analysis and choosing the 20% of material or techniques that will give you 80% of the outcomes that you want. This is really critical because whether it's a physical skill like swimming uh, or streamline right, streamline left, total immersion is the method you should take a look at, uh, completely rethinks the biomechanics, or language where you find that, let's say, one and a half percent of the available vocabulary in English gives you, you know, 90 plus percent of, of what you'll encounter in, in, in the written world. So the, the material beats the method, if that makes sense. So people somewhat obsess about which method should I use to learn Spanish as this one example, whereas the question they should be asking is what material should I focus on? The method is so secondary, and that's the difference between being effective, doing the right things, and doing things quickly, which is being efficient. And doing something quickly doesn't make it important, right? So that's, that's the first S. The next S is sequencing, which is putting those that material in the right order. And this is so critical. That's why the story that Kevin was talking about with the foundry, then the lathe, then the this. That's a logical progression. And what you'll find is that the reason people fail at learning most things in school is because the progression is off. The sequence is all screwed up. And uh, as an example, uh, Josh Waitzkin, who is the basis for searching for Bobby Fischer, he's thought of as a chess prodigy. He's become a friend of mine. And when he took his first formal classes, he was taught in reverse. That means he didn't start with openers. The teacher said, look, the openers are like cheating on the math exam. You can memorize a bunch of, uh, a bunch of things and uh, it'll make you feel good, but they're not flexible principles. So we're gonna start with king and pawn versus king. Empty board. We're gonna start with the end game so you can learn principles, right? So sequencing, asking, again, one of these absurd questions, what if I did the opposite, right? What if I did the exact opposite? So you go to a golf coach, who's maybe not top, top of the field, look at how they teach and then just try to do the, the progression in reverse. And you, you stumble upon some really fascinating breakthroughs that way. Uh, and then the last is stakes. And so this came up when we were, I was watching that motorcycle video. Oh my God. Uh, and the stakes are very important, uh, meaning you know, steak like vampire, steak through the heart steak, not cooking steak. Consequences are very important. So the, the reason that most people don't say 
uh, change their diet or quit smoking uh, is there's no short-term or intermediate penalty or reward, right? So mm -hmm. one thing that a very good friend of mine, A.J. Jacobs, did, he's a hilarious writer who does a lot of work for Esquire. He wanted to lose weight. A.J. is Jewish. He wrote a check for $1,000 to the American Nazi party and gave it to a friend of his and said, if I don't lose X number of pounds by Y point in time, I want you to mail this in and I'll be on the public record as having donated to the American Nazi in party. His name. Right, and he, had, he wasn't morbidly obese. He had what he would describe as a python that swallowed a goat physique. Maybe not ideal. Pretty common for a lot of people who sit down most of the day. And uh, he lost the weight because he had consequences. He didn't even have a good method. He didn't even have a good diet. Didn't matter. He had incentive. And people respond to incentive. So that's a very long answer, perhaps. But the DIS framework allows me to sit down with any subject. Yeah, I just started a podcast. I applied it to podcasting. You can, it's, you can apply it to anything. It is a flexible framework. That's interesting. So um, one thing you touched on that I'd like you to dive in a little bit more is, and you've talked about this in your books, you find someone who isn't the best in the world, but they're usually second best or they're overcoming some kind of a disability. Um, why do you think that's the best way to uh, get information you need to, to learn a new skill? I can only speak subjectively from my experience, but the, the reason it's, it's tempting and also sometimes counterproductive to go after the best person in the world, for instance, when Phelps was breaking all of his records, you could try to reach Phelps, you're not going to reach Phelps. Number one, because he's in the limelight and getting all the attention. Number two, he has agents and managers and all of these, these gatekeepers. Uh, number three, oftentimes the people who have been doing something for 30, 40, 50 years and are the best. Now, granted, he wasn't doing it for 50 years. But the point is they have attributes that are somewhat mutant-like. And when you're studying, when you're trying to become very good at something, when I say very good, I say trying to get to the top 5% in the world in a year or less, which I think is possible for most things. This is general population, right? Uh, it's going to be a lot faster to go to, say, a silver medalist from two Olympics ago who is unconventional in their training. And the question you need to ask is, how much of this person's success can I attribute to attributes, and how much can I attribute to skills? And those are two very different things. You might not be able to replicate, say, the ankle flexibility and foot size of Michael Phelps, but you could look at, say, Shinji Takeuchi, who is a Japanese uh, swimmer, became famous for videos on YouTube related to total immersion swimming. Uh, so Shinji, S-H-I-N-J-I. -I. Just search Shinji and total immersion swimming on YouTube. You'll be blown away. And he learned to swim very late, but became extremely famous for effortless technique. So I'll start there, and then I'll work on the attributes. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of accessibility, it's a matter of replicability, and it's a matter of cost effectiveness. It's amazing how cheaply you can get advice from people who are, just because they had a, an off day, second best in the world two Olympics ago. $50 on Skype video. I mean, it's mind-blowing. That's amazing. And, and I also think maybe, like you said, that, that mutant-like ability where they are the best, they might not even be able to verbalize or transfer what they know, what makes them so good. But if it's someone who is not, you know, in the top 5%, but not the best, they've had to figure out how to do it. And that's something that they can share then. Definitely. And you're looking for, in my case, I'm looking for anomalies. So you, you could say take the 10,000-hour rule approach but you, and you sort of scrub out a lot of the interesting outliers when you're looking at averages and medians. So my job is to look for the, the oddities. And you know, as Warren Buffett would say, in, in counter to, say, uh, efficient market uh, theorists, he would say, well, sure, like you're, the example you give is if you had a million orangutans flipping quarters, eventually you're going to find you know, 200 that flip 1,000 in a row, just statistically or whatever it might be, right? You end up with these seemingly... Uh, skilled coin flipping orangutans or, or, or monkeys. He said, now that's not in and of itself very interesting, but if they all come out of Omaha, <laughs> maybe you should go talk to the zookeeper. Something funny's going on. And so I'm looking for those types of, like, those epicenters of anomalies. And you can find them. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can find them out there. And uh, the, the other criterion that I use, so, all right, if you're not looking for the Michael Phelps and, like, you're looking for this sort of semi-best in the world, that's one target. Another target for learning is I'm just looking for someone who had the fastest rate of progress. So if someone, say, went from completely out of weight 
or bedridden to state champion in a competitive state like California in the deadlift. All right, crazy example. I would be in six months. Okay, I want to learn from them more than I want to learn from someone who's had 10 world records. Mm -hmm. Because it's that rate of progress, that zero to 60, that impresses me so much. And that usually reflects some type of unconventional approach. And you know, a good example of that would be uh, Dick Fosbury. I don't know if anybody knows that name. Uh, Dick Fosbury was famous for something called the Fosbury flop, which is not a very flattering term. But he was the first person to, in the Olympics, go backwards over the high jump bar. And up to that point, people had used a number of different approaches, you know, straddle steps and all sorts of things. And you know, initially he was laughed at, then he was ridiculed, then he was called a cheater because he won the gold medal, and now everyone does it. So what if I did the opposite? What if I went you know, backwards over the high jump, for instance? That's, that's really interesting. And I should also say, you know, the, maker, the maker mentality, I'm so embarrassed. This is the first year I've been here. I've always put it off because of traffic. I'm, I'm like allergic to traffic. Yeah, we've asked you every day. I know, and I'm finally here, and I'm having so much fun. And, and I think that the maker mentality and the, the experimental, self-experimenter bias it would, in, a, in a positive way, sort of bent of this entire community can be outward or it can be inward, right? So for me, the machine that I've tinkered with the most is my human body, right? In the case of the four-hour body. So it's like, oh, like stem cell growth factors flown in from Israel. Sure, why not inject those up and down my spine to try to reverse degenerative disc disease? You're like, oh, like sure, PRP, completely experimental at the time. Why don't I pull out my whole blood and spin it in a centrifuge and pull out growth factors and inject it into chronic injuries to try to fix those and see what happens? So I think not, I'm not recommending that everybody uh, out there do this. Uh, no, I'm, not a doc, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on the internet. But uh, I think that the, 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 the skill set of questioning assumptions and doing things, physically not so much, but doing things for the hell of it, I think is the, the core of creativity. And so when I heard with one of the earlier presenters, you know, how much you, all right, all right, it wasn't that practical, but like how many of the projects are really practical? It's the most impractical projects that people are passionate about for whatever reason that they can't get out of their heads that end up later changing the world in very practical ways. There's so many examples of that. Yeah. So, um, like you said, you, you try a lot of things for your, your health, your fitness, your diet. What are you currently tracking right now, and how, how are you tracking it? I'm not tracking all too much. I find that, that if you look at the quantified self-movement, and uh, I, well, Kevin played a large role in this, I, I actually attended the very first quantified self-meetup in 2008, 2009 at Kevin Kelly's house in Pacifica. I was just a small group of folks, and I got up and decided to talk about performance-enhancing drugs for 30 minutes, which, <laughs> which was fun and had a mixed reception. But uh, the, in terms of tracking, I think you can look at two different populations. You have people who track for the sake of tracking, and that's not a bad thing. It, it, to develop self-awareness or out of compulsion, they just gather a lot of data of different types. I'm very outcome-driven. So I usually have a goal, and then I'll track and test and do all these things. Uh, you know, I have this accelerometer on my wrist. This is, a, this is a Shine from Misfit. There are many of them out there. They're, they're mostly equivalent. This just happens to look aesthetically the most appealing, so I'm wearing it at the moment. Uh, I'm also doing uh, extensive blood testing every month to three months. I, I, I feel like if you can reliably, and you do reliably, take your car in every 1,500 miles to get an oil check, <laughs> if you can afford to do that, you can't not afford to have comprehensive blood testing done. If you can't trend your blood data, you're having a snapshot once a year, that is extremely, extremely haphazard and irresponsible, in my, in my opinion. So I get the Cadillac of blood tests every month to three months so I can trend things. Uh, and I took last month off of alcohol. Uh, so I'm very curious. I actually just had a blood draw yesterday. <laughs> yesterday morning, uh, which you can do with a mobile phlebotomist, by the way, for you people out there who have a little bit of, of extra cash. Does, it's not that expensive and don't no, want to go. You in, can do it what? what did you you can get a mobile phlebotomist. In other words, you don't have to go into some horrifyingly like scary, sterile, white-walled environment mm -hmm. to have your blood drawn and wait for three hours to do it. You can use a, a mobile phlebotomy service, which will bring someone to your house. You wake up, do a little stretch, they knock on the door, they take your blood, and in five minutes, they're gone. That's great. Uh, which which re removes a lot of the friction. Sure. Of, sure. Uh, and then you can have your breakfast because you have to fast. So uh, where are you getting your blood analyzed, and what, um, what are you tracking in the blood? 
So the first one's easier to answer. I use a, a service called Wellness Effects. You can check it out at wellnesseffects.com. Uh, I was an advisor. They were acquired, mm -hmm. uh, and I still use them. Uh, the What do I get tested? Well, I get a lot of things tested uh, on the order of several hundred things at a time tested. Uh, and that requires you know, seven or eight vials of blood. It's nothing too crazy. I've done 18, 20. That's more crazy. Uh, the, among the things that I find interesting to track, uh, I do not find total cholesterol very interesting. I think it's a blunt instrument that's been mispropagandized. Mis mm -hmm. uh, you can, you can, it's called the lipid hypothesis of cardiovascular disease for a reason. It's not established fact. So I don't pay a lot of attention to cholesterol. Triglycerides, hemoglobin A1C, which is basically very, very simplified, but like sort of a three-month running average of your, of your fasting glucose level. Uh, and then sex hormones. So I'll look at not only total testosterone, which I think is also kind of as blunt an instrument as total cholesterol, but free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin. I mean, you are as old as you feel, and you are as old as your blood points you out to be. I mean, there's been a lot of really interesting research publicized recently where they're taking blood, blood from younger mice and infusing it into older mice, and yeah. all sorts of interesting things happen. So, you know, optimize your protoplasm, guys. <laughs> it's worthwhile, and it's not that hard. It's actually really, really pretty easy. Uh, if you did it just for fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, and sex hormones, man, you'll feel like a million dollars, and it won't cost you but, what, maybe a few hundred dollars a quarter to get the trending? So I, I view that as the lowest hanging fruit here for almost anyone to improve their quality of life. That's amazing. So could you give me an example of something that you saw in your blood that kind of was going off track and what you did to correct it? Definitely. So uh, there are a number of other tests that I use. Uh, again, given the benefit, very low cost, uh, I do micronutrient testing, deficiency testing. Uh, so I identified at one point that I was very low in selenium, which is a trace mineral. And there are very widespread mineral deficiencies in the United States, whether that's magnesium, selenium, or otherwise. And uh, they're very important for enzymatic processes and so on, even gene expression. So uh, with depletion of topsoil, which is largely due to monocrops, you know, wheat, mm -hmm. soy, uh, corn, uh, which have depleted, you know, taken the topsoil in many places from 12 feet to like 8 inches. Uh, you're, even if you eat broccoli, broccoli in depleted topsoil give, is, is basically empty calories compared to broccoli from, from nutrient-dense soil, right? And uh, selenium is one of those things that's lost. It's very important for testosterone production. So in this case, I noticed that I was having, and this is, this is a rampant problem among tech users. I have hypotheses about why that's the case, but among male techies, even people who use laptops continually, low testosterone is just sort of uh, a, a nine times out of 10 problem. Fix the selenium deficiency, and I think it was I tripled my free testosterone and doubled my sperm count in the span wow. of about four to six weeks. That's amazing. Is that, is that yeah. from eating Brazil nuts? Was that Brazil nuts, right. Mm -hmm. And you want to get unshelled Brazil nuts if possible. Uh, just take my word for it. You can do the research. Uh, now, that doesn't mean you should eat 500 Brazil nuts. It's actually very, very dangerous. So the, the distinction between sort of over-the-counter supplement drug and then illicit drug is, is, is unimportant as far as safety evaluation goes. You can kill yourself by taking too much vitamin C. You can kill yourself by drinking too much water. It happens every year uh, with people who think they need to hydrate during marathons and they develop hypo, hyponatremia, I think it is, uh, where they have low sodium and then mm. their hearts stop working and they drop dead. So don't assume that more is better. This is a very hard thing to, to sort of crowbar into American heads, including me. Like, don't get me wrong, I've done some pretty crazy, wacky stuff, like taking, you know, I think I took 120 days worth of trans-resveratrol trans at one point which uh, for those who follow the red wine, for people who want excuses to drink red wine, there's been a lot of talk about resveratrol and the life extension benefits and its effects on telomeres and whatever. Uh, well, it turns out you have to drink like 12 cases a day for that to have much of an effect. And uh, I'm not gonna do that, but I did decide, well, it turns out that trans resveratrol has really interesting applications for endurance. And my endurance is terrible. I mean, worse than Homer Simpson. And I, t I say that from like muscle biopsies and enzymatic tests, like I am, below the x-axis. I don't even know how that happened. It's been horrible. So 
uh, I was like, oh my God, I want to become super rat. This is another thing you can YouTube. Super rat. Super rat uh, runs twice as far when he semi ODs on trans resveratrol. So I looked at the sort of milligrams per kilogram of body weight and figured out the math best I could and decided to consume like 90 days, 60 to 90 days worth of this stuff in one dose prior to a running test. And what I didn't realize at the time, and this is also uh, a good caveat for almost anything that you consume that has a label on it, uh, it was, for whatever reason, one of the fillers used in the capsules was something called Imodin. And Imodin has uh, off-label use as a laxative. So my running test did not impress anyone, <laughs> suffice to say. <laughs> um, one of the things that... Uh I think is really interesting about your approach is that you practice stoicism, uh, a, a kind of a practical philosophy. Maybe you could give a, a definition of stoicism and how you apply it in your everyday life. Definitely. Uh, so stoic philosophy, I, I've been introduced to stoic philosophy by many, many high performers. I mean, really high performers, best, best in class folks. In the same way that I've been introduced to meditation and transcendental meditation by just a slew of people you would never imagine would ever meditate. And uh, Stoicism specifically, uh, Stoic has, the word has a bad rap in modern English. I think people think of like a cow standing in the rain or somebody who doesn't feel emotion. Yeah, and that's, that's not really what Stoic philosophy represents in my mind. Uh, I, I recommend Seneca, Marcus Aurelius. Stoicism is an operating system for making better decisions and living a more fulfilled life, what it helps you to do is avoid emotional overreactions and irrational decisions. And it also helps to inoculate you against loss aversion. And I think this is so important in a culture where fear is used in the media to get clicks and sell papers. I mean, you are surrounded by fear all day long. You know, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, it is just terrify, terrify, fear, 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 <laughs> intimidate, intimidate, because that is how things sell advertising, ultimately. Uh, and if, if you look at, say, the writing of Seneca the Younger, Lucius Seneca, or of Cato, for that matter, they would practice poverty. These were people who, in the case of Seneca, were actually very wealthy. And having wealth wasn't the problem. It's when wealth has you that it becomes a disease. And... So they would practice poverty. And I thought this was such a fascinating idea. They would take a few days or a week a month and they would eat the cheapest of food, wear the cheapest of clothing, just get by covering the lowest rungs of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and asking themselves all the while, this is the English translation, of course, you know, is this the condition that I so feared? Is this what I'm really so afraid of? Is this what I'm making so many decisions to avoid, and you lose that fear and you can be seemingly courageous in taking leaps of faith, making decisions, starting new projects, because you know the worst case scenario just isn't that bad. And Stoic philosophy to me is just a great operating system for entrepreneurs or anyone who wants to get great results in high stress environments. It's, it almost seems like there's a, a link between stoicism and cognitive behavior therapy. Very close. Actually, they're very interrelated. So CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, and stoicism are very close cousins. Uh, and in fact, a book just came out recently. Uh, it's, it's one of the books that I selected for my book club, the Tim Ferriss book club. I'm trying to become Oprah for like 20 to 35-year-old techie <laughs> males or something like that. But the, uh, the, uh, there's so many ways that could be taken. Uh, the Obstacle is the Way is yep. the name of the book by Ryan Holiday. And this is written by a guy who became director of marketing at American Apparel when he was 21 years old. He's really, he's dealt with more scandal and high stakes decisions <laughs> you know, in, a given, in any given week than most people deal with over the course of a year. And The Obstacle is the Way is a, is a pull quote from a Marcus Aurelius note from Meditations. And Marcus Aurelius was the most powerful man in the world in his day. He was the emperor of Rome, and uh, he was one of the last sort of thought of good, beloved emperors. And he took these wartime notes in a journal, they were slightly more than that, that became a book called Meditations. And these were notes he wrote for himself. 
Um, but CBT and stoicism are very close rela closely related. So I, I think there's a lot of value in cognitive behavioral therapy as well. Yeah. Can you think of a, a recent example where uh, stoicism has proven valuable to you in, in something, a, a circumstance that that uh, you've been involved with? Oh, definitely. Uh, very, <laughs> very recent example. So uh, for the last year and a half or so, I've been an executive producer and the host of a TV show, filmed 13 episodes of this TV show called The Tim Ferriss Experiment, which was intended to take these rapid learning techniques and uh, field test them in different disciplines with world-class teachers, in, uh, including other students I bring in. So it's not just me doing these things. Uh, to show people they can get superhuman results without being superhuman. That was the idea. And because of many different internal challenges at Turner Broadcasting, the division responsible for that has been shut down. So my TV show is in limbo. And this is something I put a year, year and a half into. As that, that was my primary creative focus. And it was a brutal process. So stoicism has allowed me to, as objectively as possible, take a step back try to identify what the, the, where the opportunity, the hidden opportunities are in this apparent obstacle mm -hmm. and sort of dispassionately judge the situation best I can and not turn people into villains, which is, which is very easy to do. I mean, I'm a pretty fired up guy. I can like, get, oh, I'd like love competing and I get very impatient. Uh, but in this type of situation, that's not productive. And I think for negotiation, of any type for finding the lemonade and the lemons, stoicism is just, it's, it's really world class. And what's so fascinating about it as well, it's immensely practical, and if you were to read a lot of the stoic writing, it doesn't sound outdated. It could be something that was written yesterday. It is so timeless and so actionable. Uh, I'm a huge fan. And there, there are other types of philosophy that I enjoy. Uh, I, th I find the Epicureans to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Epicurus, uh, and uh, you know, funny enough, you know, Seneca and Epicurus had somewhat of a rivalry for students, so they'd begrudgingly acknowledge each other's points and then be like, but, like, he's great, don't get me wrong, but let me tell you about the Stoic school. And so you learn a lot about both in the readings of either. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the cynics as well. The cynics were great too. I mean, the, Epicurean, the Epicureans were, you know, the kind of tend your garden types, uh, enjoy the moment, take pleasure in the small things, mm -hmm. uh, a little more so than the Stoics. Mm -hmm. So I find a combination of the two yeah. to, be, to be a nice, a nice balance of sort of achievement and appreciation, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. yeah. I think we probably may be time for one more question. I am just curious about uh, what, where your curiosity is leading you right now. What, what are you delving into? Boy, my, interest, my interests are pretty wide-ranging at the moment. Uh, I'm trying to dissect what makes a good interviewer. And uh, <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. And, and what makes a good speaker? And they're very interrelated. So I, I launched a podcast about a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, a great podcast. Thank you. Uh, called The Tim Ferriss Show, which has been, uh, <laughs> it was going to be, that sounds so egotistical, but whatever. It was going to be the Tim Ferriss experience or experiment. Experiment was taken. I couldn't do it. Experience made me sound like I was copying Joe Rogan. So I was like, all right, fine. It's going to be the Tim Ferriss show. And uh, it's, it's, what's been really fun is I, I put it off for a year and a half, two years, trying to get it perfect. And then I was like, you know what? You know, like sort of borrowing from Reid Hoffman, right, chairman of LinkedIn. It's, if, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of the product that you ship, you're too late. It's like, all right, you know what? I'm going to let my, let my fans see the evolution of this podcast and the train wreck that is my interviewing style in the beginning. So, uh, so episode one, it's me and Kevin Rose. My interview technique is terrible, number one. And number, th and number two, I drink a horrendous amount of wine and just get <laughs> plastered by the end, which does not help, by the way. The uh, you know, dr like right drunk, edit sober, Hemingway aspect does not apply to audio. Uh, so I'm, I'm very fascinated by the, the return to oral tradition. I mean, it's, it's thought of as so old-fashioned. If you asked people who listen to five to ten hours of podcasts a week, do you listen to the radio? They'd be like, the radio? <laughs> like, talk radio? Heard of it? Like, this is just the rebirth of a very intimate oral tradition, and that's so fascinating to me. That's one. The other is I'm still doing all the crazy physical stuff, so 
Uh, I really want to beta test the contact lenses that allow you to uh, continually monitor your glucose levels that Google X is working on. I'm working on it. Uh, so I want to look at cogn reopening cognitive potential like perfect pitch. So there's an anti-narcolepsy drug very commonly prescribed called Valproate, which has shown some promise for uh, opening a window for developing perfect pitch in adults. Lots of side effects, by the way, so don't, please don't go out there and just start doing lines of Valproate. <laughs> uh, and uh, otherwise, I am trying to return to basics. So actually step down Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and spend more time with like dirt in between my toes. Mm -hmm. Really simple, simple things like that, which I think is neglected and we're really tactile social creatures and I've noticed that a little bit of exposure to nature with your shoes off goes a long way. So as boring or as simplistic as that might sound, I'm trying to really, for my own benefit, focus on that. That sounds fantastic. Tim, thanks so much. This has been really interesting. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. Have fun.